we all want to live in stable, healthy communities, but fostering that kind of community requires that we create diverse housing options. If we're only building for high income folks and we're building nothing for, for, for folks who are our central workforce, our cities can't survive, right? Pinellas can't survive, right, in the long term if we're hollowing out the diversity of options that people actually need to live here and thrive here. Folks all around Pinellas who need affordable housing, not just low income folks, there are a whole heck of a lot of middle income folks who are struggling to find a decent place to live in a thriving community. When people say not in my backyard, most folks are not mean spirited. It's not that folks can't figure out that, right, they don't want folks to have a great place to live. It's that they're concerned about their own financial future. They're concerned about well, what's going to happen to my property values, what's going to happen to the equity that I got in my house, what's going to happen with my kids. And so a part of the opportunity is to say, listen, you think that you're losing something, right, because we're, we're trying to build more affordable housing. But let me tell you something. You should be more concerned about what you're going to lose if you don't lean into affordable housing, right? When you don't lean into how we plan out a Pinellas County that actually works means what you get. And, and I will say this, when cities that did not plan well for the, for the growth that they were experiencing are starting to look like San Francisco. You don't have to make the case to builders. I think builders are ready to do it. You just got to incentivize this and they'll do it, right? There are very few builders, you know, are, that are going to take a loss, right, to be able to make sure this happens. But they certainly are willing to, 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 to do some additional work around, around low and moderate income housing. There are all kinds of ways we can meet this challenge. Maybe accessory dwellings are not for us, but maybe mixed income or mixed use development is. Maybe it's, you know, adaptive reuse of material. I don't know, but wow, look at the possibilities in this moment for creating innovative solutions. Wow, like let's lean into that. What a great way to start today's conversation. Hi, I'm Blake Lyon, Director of Pinellas County's Building and Development Review Services. Welcome to the second session of Homes for Pinellas Virtual Summit Series. This is the second in a five-part series focused on what it takes to build homes that are affordable to everyone who lives in this community. Today's session, we're going to hear from the people directly involved in the supply side of this challenge, developers. You'll hear from three developers experienced in building homes that are affordable. They will talk about what helps and what gets in the way. Then we'll take your questions and discuss with them about what we can do here in Pinellas County. In session one, Dr. Tiffany Manuel stressed the importance of changing that conversation about affordability from problem talk to solution talk. Our three expert panelists are going to help take us to the next step by looking at solutions that can work right here in our community. That conversation continues in two weeks as we discuss how local governments can come, become more innovative, clearing the way for more diverse local housing options. So if you haven't already, please make sure you sign up for all the sessions today. Before we bring in our panelists, I'd like to share some personal perspective on this issue. I've been an urban planner for more than 20 years, working in local governments on land use, zoning, housing, environmental and economic development policies, both in California and Florida. But my own experience as a resident has shown what can happen if communities don't get out in front of this issue, especially when demand for affordable housing begins to severely outpace the supply. Before relocating to Pinellas County, I lived in Northern California on the San Francisco Peninsula. My family and I lived in a working class neighborhood adjacent to downtown. We were fortunate enough to have a neighbors that treated us like family. In fact, across the street, we had one neighbor that we affectionately knew as Uncle Earl. Uncle Earl was an amazing artist. He was always making or hand painting toys for my children. True to his Hawaiian roots, Uncle Earl was the type of individual who always had something to share, who took great pride in his work and his home. Unfortunately, when his pa partner passed away in 2013, Uncle Earl decided to move back home to Hawaii so he, could, so he put his modest but well-decorated home on the market. Pretend for a moment that you're interested in, in buying this home. Consider purchasing, you know, here are the particulars. The property is a little over 5,000 square feet, it has three bedrooms, one bathroom. That's right, one bathroom, a one car garage totaling about 960 square feet. It's built in 1950. What do you think that home's worth? What would you be willing to pay for it? What could you afford to pay for it? 
Uncle Earl sold this house in 2014 for $1.4 million. For you homeowners out there, that's a monthly mortgage payment of over $6,400 per month. If you're renting, that's a rent of approximately $4,000 per month. In session one, we heard from Dr. T that the median two bedroom apartment in Pinellas County was just over $1,200 a month. For that to be affordable, you would need to make at least $23.19 per hour. But at $4,000 a month, you would need to make over $76 an hour. That's $160,000 annually. This isn't just a one-off story because of Uncle Earl's amazing interior decorating. If you look at the Zillow map of this entire neighborhood, there is not a single property in this neighborhood that does not have an M behind the price tag. I can guarantee you that not all of these houses were as nice as Uncle Earl's home. My reason for telling you all of this, if we don't start addressing the housing supply challenges, more and more communities will trend in this direction. The challenge of finding affordable housing will get worse for people with low and moderate incomes. For those of you that might be thinking, oh, this is a California problem, this is exactly why I'm living here, I'm here to tell you that this is an issue facing the entire country. Some regions more than others, but the entire country is behind on supply. This map illustrates how many households per hundred are affordable to extremely low income families. You will see that California is not the only state where this is an issue. Florida has similar concerns. When we look at Pinellas County, we see that the current demand is far outpacing supply. Forecasted over the next 10 years, the projected demand will be over 4,000 units greater than supply. This gap will continue to grow if we don't start changing our approach, both in our policies and by being more creative in our design. As mentioned in session one by Dr. T, she spoke about reframing the conversation, moving away from problem talk into a position where we can be adaptive leaders to tar start talking about solutions. Here's one example of a solution. Take a look at this photo. It looks like a large single family home that fits well within the others on the block, right? Please take a minute and indicate how many dwelling units you think are actually in this house. On your screen, you'll see that you can indicate one, two, three, four, or five. Before I reveal the answers, let's take a look at some of the responses. A few people, six people indicated one unit. The large majority of you are thinking three, four units. The real answer is three. The answer doesn't, or the number doesn't really matter as long as you scale the house and it fits into that neighborhood. This kind of house scale multifamily development contains multiple units within a single building, but still responds to the scale and character that fits with almost any single family neighborhood. In the past, most development has happened at the extreme ends of the spectrums. Single family homes on one end, large scale multifamily projects on the other but there is a growing movement to develop housing choices between these two extremes, like this one. In the planning world, we call this the missing middle. Now it's time to hear from our speakers. Each of our three panelists is directly involved in the development and financing of homes in Pinellas County and throughout the state. They will touch on some of the unique challenges that they face when building homes for residents with low to middle incomes. Each panelist, after each panelist has spoken, We'll have some time to answer your questions. You can add your questions in the Q&A in Zoom and we'll address as many as we can. We'll also offer some time for anyone calling in by phone to ask questions at the end. Our first speaker is Sean Wilson. Sean is president of Blue Sky Communities. Blue Sky works with nonprofit organizations to develop and rehabilitate multifamily housing communities. In Pinellas County, Blue Sky has completed four developments and has one under construction. Sean got his start in 1992, working for a nonprofit housing organization in Miami on recovery efforts after Hurricane Andrew. Since then, he has developed dozens of apartments complexes throughout Florida by leveraging private investment with federal housing credits and many other sources. Sean is the past chair of the Coalition of Affordable Housing Providers of Florida and current Legislative Affairs Chair. Welcome, Sean. 
Thank you very much, Blake. And uh, thanks to everybody at Pinellas County and Forward Pinellas for organizing this and uh, making it available. Uh, to everybody, not only in Pinellas, but around the state. It's obviously, a lot of the, uh, the challenges that Pinellas County is facing are being faced by a lot of, uh, of the other uh, big urban counties. And a lot of the solutions that you're, uh, that you're proposing are also solutions uh, that, that other cities and counties uh, can benefit from. So uh, thank you very much for having me and thank you for, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, there's a, a couple of points that I wanted to make before I get into my main points, and that is that um, the uh, the e-blast that y'all sent out a few days ago about this uh, said when you uh, when you hear this panel, you will hear what it takes uh, to solve the problem or to develop more affordable housing or more workforce housing. And I want to say that the 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 number one what it takes is political will. And you have that in Pinellas County. And I would be remiss if I did not recognize uh, a very strong indication of political will by the city of St. Petersburg in August when my company, Blue Sky, uh, faced a, a big NIMBY battle. And I have been in many NIMBY battles in my nearly three decades. And um, the, the city of St. Petersburg uh, City Council uh, really uh, came through with, with amazing support. And so if we can replicate that, uh, we, can, we can clear a lot of hurdles. Uh, there's there's two, two other things that I wanna uh, make sure everybody knows about. Number one, the, the biggest thing that we can all do is get the Sadowski Act fully funded. And I'm not gonna bore everybody with the details. I think most people on this, uh, on this uh, webinar know what that means. It takes a lot of education and lobbying in Tallahassee to get that done. And then the other thing is, um, is the Florida Housing Finance Corporation right now. And now this will get a little parochial. The Florida Housing Finance Corporation has two open board seats and there are no board members from the Tampa Bay area, either from Pinellas or Hillsborough County. So, I really hope that folks on this call who are from Pinellas uh, can think of somebody who they can recommend and they can go right to the governor's website and, and anybody who's interested in applying can apply for a, a board seat on the FHFC board. Um, well, I'm gonna share my screen and... Uh, and we'll get started. Does everybody know that Pinellas County has a workforce housing development machine? Uh, well, you do. You, you do have a machine and it consists of developers, architects, engineers, uh, lawyers, general contractors, property managers, government agencies, uh, government staff uh, like you, Blake. And, um, and, and that's, a, that's a machine that works really well. It's... Um, it's a, it's a well-worn machine, uh, but it needs fuel. And, um, and the, the fuel is primarily money, uh, but also land. And um, as you can see in the, in the top of this slide, uh, the, the, the machine and, uh, and the, the developers are sort of, uh, they're, they're on the side of the road because they don't have any fuel. So the machine can't go and we all want the machine to go. Um, those people need to get to where they're going, but they don't have to build a car. Um, they don't have to change a tire. They don't have to do a major engine overhaul. Uh, they ha all that stuff is, is all set up to go. What they need is fuel. And, um, and so the, I, I would encourage local governments to, uh, to continue and Pinellas County has done an amazing job with the Penny Fund um, uh, to, I would encourage local governments to continue to find cash resources to incentivize uh, workforce housing development. So if you create a policy where you're setting goals for different AMI levels or different types of housing, as Blake, you mentioned, you, you showed a picture of a triplex, but there's also single family homes and multifamily communities if the local government can set the policy and, and make the cash incentives or land available, uh, that's, that, that is the fuel 
that, that is needed. Now, developers, we bring our own money to the table and we bring private money to the table. And there's a lot of great lenders, big banks out there that, uh, that, that provide money, but, but that's, it's not quite enough. And we need the, the pump primed and we need that fuel to have a little additive. And, and those all uh, come, from, come from government agencies. And then of course, when, all, when it all comes together, then we see in the bottom uh, picture, in the bottom image of this slide, what we want to see, which is the machine is going. Um, so that's one important point. Now, did I ever tell you, Blake, about the uh, about the magic box that has seven and a half million dollars inside of it? <laughs> Well, you, there, no, there are many. They're invisible. It's an invisible box. You can't see it. Um, but, uh, but, you know, a lot of people know that the 9% housing credit is very competitive and, it, and it's very limited. But did you know that the 4% housing credits are essentially unlimited? There's a lot of, there's a lot of them out there and it, it would be very difficult for you to use them all up. So it's essentially unlimited. And, but you can't get them um, unless, you, un unless you bring some substantial subsidy dollars to the table. So I wanted to quickly go through, if we were trying to plan an 85 unit affordable housing community, these are kind of the numbers that it might take. Um, a bank loan of about $3 million, an agreement by the developer to defer about $750,000 of our fee, and about $7.5 million of, of local or state funding. When you, you put the 3 million and the 750 and the 7 million five all together and put them in this magic box, close the lid, say abracadabra, open it up, guess what? There's another seven and a half million dollars of federal housing credits in there that, that, that you will get automatically. And so that's, that's a really vital resource that gets underutilized all across the nation every year. Um, and and it, it's, it's a shame that it's federal money that if it's, and it's use it or lose it. If it doesn't get used, it's gone. Now you, it recycles every year, but it's, it's really there. It's really there. And, and we have done a couple of transactions in Hillsborough County where the county has stepped forward with a relatively large multi-million dollar allocation. Um, and we have been able to create a 4% uh, housing credit uh, property without any other funding uh, from the state or, uh, or any other competitive cycle, just the 4% housing credits. And, um, and, and I, would, I would encourage uh, Pinellas County and the jurisdictions in Pinellas County to look for ways to come up with large amounts of subsidy uh, to, to get a 4% project done. And that would probably also come through the Pinellas Housing Finance Authority, uh, which is, which is a, a key uh, governmental agency um, that, that would participate in a 4% transaction. My final slide is um, this is this is going to address a little bit of the missing middle conversation uh, that Dr. T talked about. What I did was I I collected some data which Caitlin Murphy from Pinellas County um, helped me uh, obtain from the Schimberg Center. Thank you very much, Caitlin. And so what we what I did was I created this pie chart which shows um, the the income level of all of the severely cost burdened households in Pinellas County. So 50% cost burden means that that household is paying more than 50% of their income for housing, which means they can't afford it. There's a lower level of cost burden, which is between 30 and 50%, where it'd be nice if it was below 30%, but people can afford to pay a little more than 30% they can't really afford to, afford to pay more than 50%. Now, the biggest category that you see here is the bright blue. That's people at 30% AMI or less. A lot of those households are not really in the workforce. They may be on fixed incomes. They probably were in the workforce for many decades. They may not be anymore, um, uh, but, but, but they might be. The orange and the gray 
it, that is the, that's the, the, the majority of the real workforce that, that I, I think of when I talk about workforce housing. And so you can see that about 50% of all of the severely cost burden households are in that range. Again, with, with another 40% or so in the lower range. Only 7% of, of all of the severely cost burden households are between 80, uh, are, are greater than 80% AMI. So local governments have a very finite amount of dollars that they can put in, even with Penny, even with what Hillsborough County has put in recently. The dollars are finite. The land is finite. What's not finite among the things that government can do are things like increased density and other regulatory reforms. I would urge local governments to not spend their dearest resources, that is their money, on the greater than 80% AMI households for two reasons. Number one, it, that, then you're only addressing a very narrow slice of the population that needs it and number two, the overall benefit may be, may, may be very limited. So again, regulatory reforms, increased density, fee waivers, all of those should be on the table and all of those should be, should be flooded out there to address the 80% to 120% AMI. Money and land to a lesser extent, but certainly the money should really be for the 80% AMI and below. And, um, and, and those, are, those are the points that I wanted to get across today. Blake, I wanna thank you and the folks at Forward Pinellas and Pinellas County once again for, um, for making this, for, for making, uh, this uh, summit a reality. And I'll be around to answer any questions later. Thank you, Sean, greatly appreciated. Our second speaker today is Jake Zunneman a senior vice president of development uh, with the housing trust group. HTG is a full service developer of multifamily residential communities with experience in Florida and throughout the Southeastern United States and Arizona. Jake has substantial experience in real estate acquisitions. He's also well-versed in all aspects of low income housing tax credit financing. Welcome Jake. Hey, thank you so much for uh, the very warm introduction and um, really just feel honored and very appreciative that I uh, was asked to speak and, um, you know, just lend some knowledge and experience from uh, transactions I've been a part of and Housing Trust Group has been a part of. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen here and hopefully you can get it uh, right with regards to, not, maybe not perfectly, but um, all right. So um, again, thank you everybody for having me. Um, I'm Jake Zunneman, uh, SVP of Development with Housing Trust Group. Uh, what you see on your screen there um, is a development that we did over in the city of Bradenton uh, called the Addison. It was financed with 9% tax credits, uh, some sale dollars, some CDBG, uh, and a few other you know, sources of funds. Um, I think Sean did a really excellent job you know, talking about the magic box and a lot of the resources that are out there. So um, I'm going to focus more of my presentation on uh, this as a you know, case study and just to talk about other municipalities and uh, what I've seen be successful and you know, maybe things that Pinellas is already doing or could implement in the future. Um, here's just a quick slide about uh, our company and some of the areas that we're developing in. Um, won't spend too much time here other than just to say that you know, we, we kind of look anywhere and everywhere throughout the state uh, for opportunities um, and just through that, you know, have just, you know, grown tremendously in terms of working with lots of different, um, you know, architects, builders, all the folks and stakeholders that Sean had mentioned, um, and really would just like to kind of continue that trend uh, over on the West Coast in Pinellas. Um, so we're going to be talking about the Addison and a quick case study on that. Um, so it's located in the city of Bradenton. Um, as far as the units go, it's a family development. 23 one bedrooms, 55 twos, 12 threes. Um, so a nice mix uh, for diverse you know, population and different families. One of the big things that we did here and one of the tools that I think is really important for all municipalities to be aware of 
uh, is this you know, tax law that got put in place that has this concept of income averaging. Uh, and the concept there is that you know, what probably most folks are familiar with is doing a lot of uh, you know, quote unquote affordable housing developments that um, have 10% of the units at extremely low incomes and 90% of the units at affordable incomes or 60% AMI, um, area median income. One of the things that this bill did was, you know, in the tax law is basically allow you to uh, shift and do more 70% area median income, uh, income in units or 80% area me median income units and basically offset those with 30%, 40%, 50%. And the concept there is that when you combine the two, you're going to get to a 60% average, which is the quote unquote affordable housing that we all play in. And what you're doing there is you're meeting uh, some of that missing middle that we hear about. And you're also meeting, you know, the extremely low income side, which uh, frankly, you know, they're, they need a lot of housing as well. Um, and so what I'm really proud of on this development is that basically, you know, we were able to do units at that ELI, the 60%, the 70%. And we even have 13 market rate units there as well. Um, the amenities are all really fantastic. I mean, one of my favorite memories is bringing uh, my three-year-old son, I guess he was maybe a little younger than two at the time, played on the playground, walked around the dog park, asked where our dog was, um, went by the pool, saw families playing it. And so um, it's just really special. And you know, basically any property that I'm a part of, I want to make sure uh, it's a place I would want to live and you know take my wife and two kids and dog. Um, and the last piece that was really special is part, and I'll get into that a little bit with uh, some of the form-based code and, and zoning that was there, was you know we were able to do a commercial space that right now is being used by um, you know, basically local business, a uh, young woman and her family who do uh, insur health insurance, taxes, they have the nurse referral programs. So they have a lot of definitely seasonal uh, services that they provide and that's been really successful. And that's also incorporated uh, into uh, the development. Um, so how do you finance these? Um, you know, obviously low income housing tax credits, you hear a lot about the 9%, the 4%. I think Sean did a, a good job of touching on that. You know, state apartment incentive loans, some of those local state monies that he's talking about, um, or they're just out there, you know, they are soft resources that you can get. And, you know, I think one of the big things is, is looking at Florida housing and saying, hey, how do we leverage those dollars and look at their programs and look at what their, you know, their goals are and how do we join them with our own um, community development block grant. That was a big part uh, that Bradenton was able to provide in terms of uh, cleaning up some of uh, the environmental concerns that were there and you know, getting us to a no further action letter. Um, land, land, land. I think to the extent that land is available by the municipality or you know, rezonings can be done or affordable housing components can be put in place. Land is always the biggest issue. And this one was really fantastic because um, it was a private seller, but we were able to work on you know, extended time and lower price basically to get this done. Uh, the last two without spending too much time on them, um, is really just to speak with regards to the Brownfield program. I think that is very underutilized and a lot of times has this connotation that, um, you know, maybe it's a toxic wasteland or it's not suitable. Um, but realistically, you know, you can designate pretty much any site of Brownfield if there's, uh, you know, a potential for contamination or there's a potential concern. It doesn't need to be uh, this toxic wasteland. And therefore, that's another place that you can bring in you know, sales tax rebate money on the back end, voluntary cleanup tax credits that can also fund your developments. Um, here's just another kind of aerial of the project. Um, you'll see in the bottom left corner there, that's where the commercial space is. Uh, and on uh, the front, you know, we've kind of created these stoops and just kind of walkway entrances um, into the unit. So a lot of placemaking and other things going on there. Um, so how do you incentivize developers? Um, I really want to leave a lot of time for your third speaker, who I know is going to do uh, just fantastic job at more local level. And um, just, I think she's doing great work and it's going to get probably more into some of these zoning code things, but it's land availability, uh, form-based zoning code so that we as developers, you know, we don't need guarantees, but we have a little bit more of certainty about uh, what we're going to build and how we work through parking and height and density and all those kind of things. Uh, the big thing that Bradenton does that I think is really phenomenal is they have multiple CRAs, comprehensive housing plans um, that really focus on what it is that they want. Um, one of the things that I've seen Blue Sky be very successful at and we've been successful at is applying for these RFAs at the state level that are either you know, homeless, revitalization, 
uh, kids aging out of foster care, uh, you know, disabling conditions. I think to the extent that, you know, those things are baked into housing plans and form-based zoning codes and align with what's going on at the state level, you know, you might not get 100 and 200 unit projects every year, but you'll get a 30 unit here, a 60 unit there, 50, and you just kind of start building on that momentum. Um, so with that, I'd pass it back uh, to your host and just thank you again for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Jake. Much appreciate your comments. Our final speaker for this session is Jillian Bendis. She's in a position at Manis management at Bendis Construction, a firm with a wide portfolio of commercial work in the public and private sectors across the state of Florida. Jillian also has a personal interest in affordable housing and transportation policy. She is the founder and president of Yimby St. Pete, an organization that advocates for policies that say yes to housing that everyone can afford. Welcome, Jillian. Hello, thanks for having me today. And thank you to Pinellas County uh, and the Pinellas County Commission. You guys have been just great allies in the fight to get more affordable housing. Uh, I'm gonna start out my slide today uh, with a, a little bit of a lesson on uh, how to create more affordable housing without having to dedicate more money towards the cause. Uh, Jake, I'm assuming you can see my screen. Is everyone able to view? Okay, wonderful. Yes. So uh, we are looking at affordable housing here in St. Pete from uh, kind of a policy-based perspective. And YIMBY St. Pete uh, stands for Yes in My Backyard. You know, Jake and Sean have done a great, uh, great job at explaining what they faced on the NIMBY front. And in terms of the pushback to that, we're seeing really incredible support for uh, inclusive zoning policies, policies that recognize that what we've been doing for the past 50 years just hasn't been working. Um, and kind of a newfound understanding that developers and nonprofits can work together to achieve the goals of affordability that everybody wants. So if you wanna take an example of your average lot in St. Pete, which is where our primary location is for activism, uh, we talk about the average 4,800 square foot lot. And Everyone on the panel here and probably many in our audience are familiar with the FAR requirements, which are floor area ratio. That dictates how much of the uh, buildable land you can use for an actual dwelling. And so depending on how you run the numbers, you can build on either 40% or 60% of the lot. And we're just, for the purposes of this example, going to use 60% if you comply with architectural guidelines. And so that comes out to 2,880 square feet of residential building space. Now that's a single family home on a 4,800 square foot lot. Now we're gonna get into costs to build. This is always a, a very divisive topic. What does it cost to build new residential construction in Pinellas County or elsewhere? Well, if you talk to some big track builders who have a ton of land to work with developing new subdivisions you can talk about 70, 80, 90 bucks a square foot. If you talk about urban infill or homes within an already dense geographical area like Pinellas County, I think 110 bucks is more like your, your average square foot cost. Now, you, you, I've talked to some folks before I, I got on this panel to check these numbers. Some are saying more, some are saying less. But again, for the purposes of this discussion, we'll say 110 bucks a foot. If you take that single family home, at 2,880 square feet and multiply it by 110 a foot, you get a 316,000 square foot home. Now, my math is not so far off because you're looking at the average home cost for, uh, you know, according to Redfin and, and it's just below that. So maybe Redfin is accounting for some older homes being sold, but the median sale price in Pinellas County right now, or in St. Petersburg, excuse me, is, is 282. So we can, we can get this idea of this range happening for a new single family home. And we you know, heard some really interesting statistics thanks to uh, 
can, unfortunately, when they're cost burdened. So let's just play out the rest of this example and say that single family lot is actually zoned for a triplex. And we talked about the FAR being 0 0.4, 0 0.6, but just bear with me here and let's say the FAR is 0 0.7. If you can have a 0 0.7 FAR or a 70% buildable area on that lot, you have 3,360 square feet. You divide that into three for a triplex and you have three units at around 1,100 square feet each. Now, this is a perfectly acceptable size for a family. I mean, this is a two bedroom house. This is a two bedroom condo. Um, different configurations can accommodate different lifestyles. Uh, the trend in many, many major growing cities is smaller. So the idea that this is not acceptable is sort of outdated. So we are looking at three perfectly acceptable dwellings on a lot that was formerly designated for one unit and now can house three. So what does that do to the cost? We're gonna bump the square foot cost up from 110 to 125. That's simply to accommodate additional systems that are required in the, uh, in the triplex construction. And you now get three units at 140,000 square feet. Excuse me, $140,000. So the end of this long-winded analogy is that you want one single family home for 316 or you want three different you know, individual units for $140,000? The answer to me is pretty clear. You know, we have a growing problem and I don't need to go through the scope of the issue. The past panelists have done a very good job of that. And I think again, Ford Pinellas and Pinellas County really does understand the scope of the issue. Um, but the question is how to get there and what policies are realistic in order to get us there. And so it's, it's pretty clear that government subsidies, even though they're, they're important and they're you know, incredible tools to really boost up affordability at the lower end of the AMI spectrum, we need to talk about really holistic ways to reinvent the problem, to reinvent the solution, to kind of look at big sweeping changes that can dramatically shift the, shift the ball. You know, you can't just continue with the policies that we've had for decades and expect this problem to change. And so um, my original question on this panel is, um, you know, what is it going to take? And, and I said it was going to take, I said it was going to take money, or excuse me, I, I, it was, it was going to take um, math. And so, uh, you know, the math problem is, you know, only part of it. The political will is uh, another big part of it. You have a lot of people who are reflexively against these kinds of policies, who think that the single family home is an American ideal. Um, it's a little bit changing the hearts and minds. And our work with Yimby St. Pete is trying to do that. Um, but I will say that we have made significant progress. We have neighborhood associations in St. Petersburg who are sympathetic to this cause. It is really, really exciting. We have a bunch of city council members who are on board with these types of policies, maybe not in their entirety, and maybe they have some nuanced differences, but on the whole, they are on our team. And it was clear, you know, from Sean's Blue Sky Project at the Grace Community Church uh, just a few weeks ago, despite tremendous opposition, the entire city council voted in favor of that development. Well, that shows the political will to really move the ball on this issue. And we think this is the only way to do it. Um, I'm actually gonna turn it over back to our moderator now for questions because this is not just, um, you know, kind of a change you make overnight. It's not something that just gets done by writing a few more laws and, and you know, calling it a day. This is a long-term solution that you really need to try and work on. Um, so it will take a lot, but this is truly the way to get there. Well, thank you, Jillian. Greatly appreciate your thoughts and insights on that. So now we're going to move into our question and answer period. So if you have questions for our panelists, please type them in the Q&A feature in Zoom. You can also give a thumbs up to questions that other people have asked, and we'll take those questions. Um, if anyone raises their hand in the Zoom, we'll unmute you and you can also speak. If you're on the phone, you can hit star nine to raise your hands. So let me start, if I may, with a couple of questions. Um, Sean and Jake, you both talked about projects. And Sean, in your example of the magic box, you kind of used 85 units. And Jake, in yours, you, you showed your Addison project and certainly has a higher uh, density to that project. 
how do you begin to address some of those concerns that may come up where people say, I don't want the large scale multifamily development? Is there, is there a density range or a scale that you all need to get to in order to make those projects financially viable? Can you give us a little context around that? Well, I mean, you know, for people who say they don't want um, a large scale or, or, you know, or very dense uh, development, I mean, I usually point out that our developments are actually very small when compared to most apartment complexes. I mean, most apartment complexes are a couple of hundred units. Ours are usually in that 60 to 80 to 90 range. So they actually are not that large is one point that I try to make. And then, you know, the other point I try to make is that we do tax credit housing and tax credit housing is is not section eight. And so we spend a lot of time educating uh, local folks uh, and everywhere. We spend a lot of time educating them on how nice these developments look, both when they're built and on the and long term. So we um, we point out uh, prior developments in their area, and we urge them to drive by. And um, you know that that's th- th- those are some of the main things uh, that we do to try to uh, make people understand that um, that it's not as big as they think it is, and it's not. It's not ugly like they probably imagine it will be, or ugly like they, like they saw back in the '70s before the tax credit program existed. I mean, I think to quickly add to what Sean's saying and to answer a question I've seen from uh, Penelope in the chat. I mean, I think high level, you know, it's all about communication. Uh, when I've developed Addison and other projects in Bradenton, you know, I've sat in people's homes and held neighborhood meetings. And I think it's about being transparent and working through the things that you can, uh, and then being clear about the things that you can't. You know, I had a meeting in Tallahassee on a project that I'm under construction right now, and they had a list of like 20 things they wanted. Uh, one of the ones I could easily do is like, hey, save all those trees. You know, it looks like your plan is going to cut down a bunch of these trees. We want trees here. That's part of our neighborhood. I'm like, done. They're like another thing we want is for you to do uh, underground parking on all the units. I'm like, impossible. Uh, we just can't, I can't do that with uh, financing. So I think a lot of it is, is having those clear conversations and being malleable to things that you can do versus what you can't. And I think the big thing is what uh, Sean said as well, is being clear about who these communities serve and who's coming there. I know in one of the pre-meetings we had, you know, it's a question about, hey, who is this affordable housing for? Uh, you know, we own and manage these properties. As Sean knows, you know, we put Laura's land use restriction agreements on them. We're they have to be affordable for 50 years. We have banks, lenders, equity providers that you know we're on the hook for if things don't go well. So when we manage these properties, we do an extreme amount of compliance, background checks, uh, eviction reports, all those things so that, you know, look, we're building this because we're not going to be able to flip this. We don't want to flip it, frankly. We want to be a good neighbor. We want to be in your community. We want to help see that growth. So it's important to us that the folks that live there, just like you don't want them causing problems for you, we, we don't really want them causing problems for us. We just want to help families and seniors that, you know, frankly, might have something going on in their life. They need a leg up for a little bit. And this is going to give them that opportunity to have more disposable income, more savings, and, you know, move, move on to the, to the next phase. So, Great. Thank you. Uh, Jillian, I have a question that maybe you can start with and certainly welcome other comments as well. Um, you talked about a little bit more creative uh, zoning policies and trying to address that. And we've seen a few of those come out of kind of other cities around the country. Um, Most notably, probably Miami 21, Uh, Portland has some efforts. We've seen some recent adoptions, or I should say maybe even uh, out zoning uh, single family in cities like Minneapolis. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts and ideas or how you begin to approach some of those more creative zoning solutions and whether you think they have merit? Absolutely. There are so many solutions that we could employ to either upzone or do some creative types of zoning to accommodate new types of of housing. Um, It's a big cultural problem, as I mentioned, and changing the hearts and minds of people to understand that a single family home really is not the only or even best way of housing people is 
a long-term process. Um, I live in a sort of mixed neighborhood with some multifamily dwellings as well as some single family dwellings and no one even notices. In fact, the diversity of residents and frankly, the diversity of uh, you know, racial distributions and income levels and sexual orientations and you know, these things all come with um, diversity of housing. I mean, it allows people to live together who are uh, you know, off in their own enclaves. It, you, know, you call them income enclaves because the housing typologies are so segregated. Um, housing and zoning plays into larger conversations about what's going on in our communities and in our politics in such a big way. Um, and I think if we were to open up those floodgates, we would see a lot more um, you know, diversity and inclusion, frankly. It's a, it's a cultural thing as well as a housing thing. Now, specifically in St. Petersburg, you know, we have a long history of accessory dwelling units. And a lot of attention has been paid to uh, opening up construction of ADUs in different types of lots um, you know, the minimum lot size has been reduced by city council last year. Um, and I think that's probably an important step. But, you know, here at Yimby St. Pete, you know, my board and our supporters believe that ADUs should be allowed almost everywhere. I, I mean, what is what is the reason that they shouldn't be allowed there? I mean, is there um, some kind of hazard that's created when you allow a few more residents into the neighborhood? I, I think actually the neighborhood is enhanced. And so um, ADUs are a big talking point for us, but then also some of the restrictions around the actual construction of ADUs. You know, ADUs have severe limitations on the way they are able to be built, um, their maximum square footage, um, the design of the actual living space within the dwelling. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy things you have to comply with. Um, why do those exist? I mean, if, you know, the quick answer as to why those existed was because in the 1970s, actually, St. Petersburg reverted from uh, you know, a mixed type of zoning designation in most of the residential neighborhoods to a single family zoning designation. Now you can talk for a long time about why that happened and why that's continued, but at the base of it, you know, we're arguing that we return to those kind of diverse routes instead of promoting this kind of monolithic design. Um, and you know, if you'll permit me just one, one quick minute here to share my screen again, um, I'd like to pull up the slide from um, the St. Pete building code which is, um, you know, it described, you know, what kinds of housing typologies are encouraged. And this is NT, which is, you know, a common single family, um, you know, with accessory designation. And they actually talk about how the NT districts should be primarily single family in character. Why? Why is that the standard? Is it the standard because that's what we've always done? Or is it the standard because that's what we should be doing? Why is it not multifamily in character so we can be more inclusive and have more housing typologies and have more affordability with our housing typologies? You know, they talk about some districts allow accessory units, you know, mixed uses. Why not all? What about character and context is inherent to a single family designation? So with that, I will get off of my soapbox and I will turn it back to the rest of our panelists. We have another audience question that I'd like to get into. Um, the question reads, affordable housing, accessible housing, workforce housing, there's a lot of different um, terms or labels that are out there. Do we feel like those labels matter or are we gonna be encountering opposition to this kind of housing no matter what we call it or how we define it? I mean, th there's, there's so many euphemisms and we're always trying to stay, you know, one euphemism ahead of the euphemism that scares people. So, I mean, you know, affordable housing, I use that term among friends, but, but when I'm not with friends, then I use the term workforce because I want, because I want folks to understand that the people that are going to live in our community are the ones in the workforce. And um, so, you know, the term affordable really is just a descriptive and doesn't, doesn't refer to any specific group of people. It doesn't tell you who's gonna live there. All it does is connote something bad, I think. So, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I like the term workforce when I'm talking about a, a, a regular community that Blue Sky builds. And I usually say senior living when I'm talking about an elderly affordable community that Blue Sky builds. 
John. We had another audience question that came in um, that I really would like to pose to, to any of you. And that is, what makes the numbers work for small density units, such maybe as the, you know, kind of the 15 to 20 range? Are there developers that are work, willing to work with small nonprofits to accomplish this? Are there tax credits available? Or does it make sense for this to be part of a tax credit project when we're talking in particular about the smaller scale? I think um, one of the things, and, and I was speaking a little bit to this, that I've been very intrigued as of lately, uh, at the state level, they have some RFAs, you know, that happen each year for small uh, permanent supportive housing. Uh, you know, there's one coming out for, uh, you know, they have a goal for kids aging out of foster care and the max units in, uh, in a large county is 30 and the minimum is 15. And I think realistically to make a deal like that work, um, you know, you're going to need very low land price. Uh, you probably need um, the housing authority to come in with some project based vouchers. I mean, the big reason why uh, most of the developments you'll see us doing minimum, you know, 50, 60 units is that, you know, you still have to hire someone to run your development. You know, you need a property manager and you need to pay them uh, something that, you know, makes sense. Uh, it's not, you know, a sliding scale. So you have one property manager and one maintenance person uh, for 60 units. You might have the same amount for 70, 80. Um, you know, there, there are just fixed costs. If you have computer programs and software used for compliance, you know, and you're, you're, you're buying those and they cost, you know, $20,000. They cost $20,000 if you have 30 units or you have 100. Um, and so there's some things that are just fixed and the economies of scale don't work that well. And we're also at, you know, capped rent. So I would say the big thing that you need to do is, um, you know, tap into, you know, project-based vouchers, maybe some soft money. If land is cheaper, and you don't have to spend money towards that. But I think there's um, a, a lot of private developers that would be open to doing that, especially with our expertise. It's just a question of, hey, who are the partners out there and how do we cobble that all together with kind of the certainty that I was you know, talking about? One of the big things on some of those smaller developments that Florida Housing has instituted, which I think makes sense for some of the RFAs and others I don't know, is something called a withdrawal disincentive. So if you're told as a developer that if you can't make this 20 unit deal happen, then we might not wanna be funding you in the future. That's kind of a scary thought for us when we don't know where all the pieces are gonna to come together. So um, I think if there's more communication, collaboration about that, um, I, I know myself and, and our company, you know, I'd love to be involved in more of those small scale. You know, maybe you're not gonna hit on some of the margins that I think someone asked in the question and you know, you know, the money that we can expect, uh, but they really are about the building block to, you know, that community and, and maybe the next project, you know, I think we're all long-term thinkers and that's why, you know, we're in this business. We're not there to do a, a quick hit project and, you know, never see that community again. So. And, and unfortunately, just to add, yeah, a 15 or 20 unit uh, development would not, you, you could not use the tax credits on that or the magic box kind of thing that I talked about. I mean, you're, you're legally allowed to, the regulations allow it, but there is no, um, there's no financially feasible way to do it. So a, a development of that size would have to have uh, its subsidy funding from other sources, not tax credits. Thank you. Um, so my next question, uh, I'm going to ask it in, in kind of a two-part series. Um, the first of which comes a little bit more from an audience question that we had. There's a tool that's been around for quite some time, uh, inclusionary housing or inclusionary zoning, where you have a requirement to pay into a fund or to provide some other means. Uh, and certainly Pinellas County has had that uh, in or at least the concept came up in 2006 in the community housing plan, but it really wasn't implemented. Do you find that this has been an effective tool in jurisdictions where you've worked? Um, and, and that's again, a more traditional tool. And then the second part of the question I really wanna get into is maybe some um, newer, more creative tools like unbundling parking. So let's start with the inclusionary housing piece. And if any of you can touch on any experience or whether you think that's a viable tool and then we'll and then we'll pivot into the parking part of it after that. Well, I mean I'll I'll throw out there because I'm a big mouth. If you're say inclusionary housing, it 
if you mean inclusionary zoning, um, I mean, I don't, I, I, from a public policy standpoint, I'd rather see an inclusionary zoning ordinance, but with a buyout provision so that really office developers and retail developers and market rate developers are really, instead of building affordable housing in their, in their development, that they're paying into a fund and then the, the dollars are being used in a targeted manner by the local government through using the machine. Um, again, and in, in, in inclusionary zoning to me doesn't mean that a market rate developer should be required to build affordable housing in their development. That makes no sense. To me, inclusionary zoning means that retail developers and, 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 not, and commercial developers should be required to pay into a fund because they're going to be hiring people that, 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 need, that need housing that's not affordable. So again, I, I'm in favor of inclusionary. I'm in, I'm in favor of ordinances but I'd rather it go into a, a fund that the local government then decides how to use effectively and efficiently. Jillian? Yeah, Sean's, Sean's absolutely right. Um, you know, you have to have a buyout provision. The, the math that goes behind implementing even a modest inclusionary zoning regulation um, is, is fairly complex and developers have a right to bristle against it. Um, you know, as part of our platform for Yimby St. Pete, we are advocating for inclusionary zoning. That's because you have to have something to scoop up some of the lower AMI folks. Um, you know, as Sean said, there's just too many people at too low of incomes that need help and are not going to be helped by simply upzoning by itself. And so last year, the city of St. Pete proposed a linkage fee, which if any of you has followed that controversy, eventually got defeated. Um, I myself was an opponent of that because I, I thought it unfairly burdened developers who are trying to promote affordability. Um, but, you know, I, there has to be something. So a pay in lieu fee with an inclusionary zoning regulation that is very, very modest, to me, seems like a good out. You know, this, this goes back to the idea of, yes, you do need some subsidy somewhere, um, but IZ is a tool. Now, has it been used in other jurisdictions? Um, you know, there are controversies about that, whether or not it's actually been effective. There are controversies about whether or not upzoning is actually effective. There is no one single fix. It's not a magic bullet, but generally creating more supply should probably help. Generally designating more in, uh, units as affordable should probably help. You have to kind of hack away at this from a lot of different angles. And the data on housing is mixed simply because people have only been exploring these kinds of new solutions for a relatively short period of time. I mean, not, not until, you know, 10 years ago was HUD building these giant, um, you know, kind of tall towers, which everybody know, you know, failed, you know, these kinds of massive affordable housing developments, that is just not the way, you know, we understand that's that kind of promotes poverty instead of decreasing it. And so being able to utilize new tools, like upzoning, inclusionary zoning, it's going to take some time for us to see the real results and understand what these actually what these policies actually mean. If I could, just to come back to the kind of second half of that question in thinking about um, any of your projects, can you give us a sense, we often hear kind of in the industry, form follows parking and parking drives some of these projects and, and certainly the ability to finance some of these projects. Have any of you taken a little bit more or a different approach to the overall parking supply that you're providing for those? Is that context driven where it depends on where the project is located, maybe in a little more downtown context, there's less parking uh, or maybe suburban context, there's more, or is it driven by your, your tenants? Um, can you talk a little bit about how you approach the parking side of it? I think parking is definitely something that, um, you know, to speak to, to the zoning and those pieces, I mean, I think to the extent that that is, you know, kind of baked in already as potential reductions or otherwise, I mean, I think the big thing that everybody needs to understand, you know, when we do developments, and I know Sean as well, I mean, again, we own and we manage them. So, you know, if we build them and we build 100 units and we offer 30 parking spaces, we don't have any type of, you know, manageable way to control that or to rent them uh, to residents or, you know, then we're just going to have a management nightmare uh, from day one. So I think, you know, a lot of it for me comes down to, you know, our vertical integration and having a conversation with, our management team day one and saying, 
hey, this is a senior development in this area, uh, or this is a family development in this area, kind of like you said, Blake, well, what do you think the minimum is? And typically, I would say, um, and this may not, you know, be beneficial uh, to me in this moment, but, you know, it's like, we want one parking space for one bedrooms, and one and a half for two, and maybe one and a half or two for three bedrooms. Uh, but realistically, I think, you know, a one-to-one -one parking ratio uh, should suffice. And then to the extent that you are in a place like a downtown Miami or a downtown St. Pete, or there is, you know, accessible, you know, just ready to go uh, public transportation, whether it be bus or Metro Mover or what have you, um, then you can have that conversation about, oh, let's go 0.5 uh, per unit. But I, I really do think, you know, when you start getting to these two spaces per unit, um, yeah, that will kill deals. Um, because ultimately, you know, you either have to put in a podium and the cost of that is just, you know, usually not feasible for us, uh, or you don't have enough land to generally put it in have a building footprint. So I think if more codes could be towards, you know, kind of one-to-one -one, and then also with the allowance of just the reduction you can expect or, hey, you know what, you as the developer go out there and do a parking study for us, you know, pay a little bit of money to have an engineer explain to us why this really is not needed in this particular project. I think those things are, are helpful. Great, thank you. I agree. Much. I think if you're in a downtown location, half a space per unit is enough. Um, if you're in a suburban location, one to 1.4 spaces per unit is enough, unless you have a ton of three bedroom units. Um, I mean, I think that most parking codes are pretty high, although most jurisdictions are being a very understanding in the recent years about uh, parking reductions on a case by case basis. So that's a definite positive trend. Jillian, I believe you're muted, Jillian, if you could just. There we go. I would just comment that why not tie parking to um, expected AMI and expected proximity to downtown corridors and downtown transit. Somebody at 30% of AMI may not have a vehicle and they're definitely not gonna have two vehicles. So why on earth would you ever require two units, two parking spaces for one unit? It doesn't make any sense, it's outdated. And just for context, that the concept of unbundling parking is a term that's often used where you can have one particular price point for the unit itself and then separate out the parking and have a different price point for that parking. So if you have a family or an occupant that only has the need for one space, they can just pay for what they need. They don't necessarily need to have multiple spaces because it certainly is a premium and, and uh, the cost uh, impact to the projects. All right, getting back to some of our um, questions from our audience. There's a question that talks about churches being very land rich and they seem to be untapped resources for development of affordable housing. To add my own uh, comment to that, we also are starting to see a lot of change in the landscape for retail. You know, with the use of online retail, we see a lot less importance on the brick and mortar stores. How do we, you begin approaching and thinking about these different traditional land uses and changing that to uh, help accommodate additional opportunities for your projects? I mean, Blue Sky, we do work with churches to redevelop the vacant land around their church building sometimes. And, um, and, and that's proven to be a, a good way uh, to, you know, to, to check a lot of public policy boxes. And so, I mean, I, you know, I would encourage um, in, in that context, I would encourage local governments to allow multifamily in their civic or institutional zoning classifications, which is usually not the case. Usually, you know, when you're redeveloping a church property, not only do you have to rezone it, but you have to get a comp plan amendment. Now let me talk about HB 1339. Um, HB 1339, which I'm not gonna go into detail about, may provide a, another avenue for redeveloping some of these civic and institutional or other commercial uses that, um, that, that have seen better days or, or are ripe for that kind of a, a redevelopment. Thank you. 
So this is the uh, open-ended question I wanted to kind of get to you all. Are there strategies or, or ideas that you all have thought about trying to do, but you, you each talked a little bit about kind of the political will. Um, so if we, can, if we can just get you to put your creative hat on for a moment, is there something you'd love to be able to try and just hasn't really captured the hearts and minds of the political will that, that's in the communities where you work? If that's too much of a hot potato, I can move on. <laughs> This is one of my favorite questions because this is really the crux of how you change these kinds of policies. People love their single family homes. They think they're great. They want a picket fence, they want a dog, they want a yard, and they don't want to have to live on top of somebody else. How do you change that mindset? And it is simply a matter of lobbying and communications. And it's a matter of doing it yourself. You have to have a family living in a condo before you understand that the family is just fine living in the condo and they can go to the park two blocks away because they can walk there. You have to have um, neighborhoods like mine, which have such a variety of people in them where you kind of understand that if these policies were implemented more on a more widespread basis, that um, you know the diversity is really a beautiful thing. I, I have friends and neighbors who are on government assistance. And I don't even know it until two years after I met them because they just are part of the neighborhood. And understanding that that's okay and that is actually a great thing, um, to me it's just, it's just Oh. Sounds like we may have lost Julian. Oh, go ahead, Julian. Well, you froze. Oh, sorry. You, you, you just have to talk part. about what a what a big problem housing is compared to the relatively small issue of what people believe to be neighborhood character. Neighborhood character is important. We have to maintain it. We have to have respectable architectural design guidelines. But the overemphasis on architectural character at the expense of affordability, to me, is sort of a grave mistake. And I I've got a couple of. Blake, and one of which we're one of which is my dream that we're finally achieving right now in the city of St. Petersburg, actually, and that is to sneak in a tax credit development on a major corridor that's undergoing a renaissance, and we're doing that in the Skyway Marina District, and so I'm um, I'm hoping that we're going to um, you know really be part of a of a long term boom uh, for that stretch of uh, of US 19. Uh, the other thing that I'd love to be able to do, and this kind of touches on a lot of things that people have talked about, would be to find a way for, for Blue Sky to, to do a bunch of infill lots in, in a mature single family neighborhood that, that really needs uh, a boost to, 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 to develop 50 or 100 duplexes or triplexes in a relatively you know, compact geographic area. And these would be for rent because that's Blue Sky does rentals. Um, but th there's only a few examples uh, of, of that that I know of around the state and there was mixed results. So, um, you know, we're, I would love to be able to, to make a big impact in a neighborhood like that, but still stay in my lane of tax credits and rentals um, and create homes that look like single family that fit with the neighborhood but like the image that you showed, Blake, that have a side door and a little unit in the back. And of course, we don't want to get stuck with having to put eight or nine parking spaces on that lot either. So um, so maybe you can touch on, um, oh, go ahead, John. Yeah, I just, I wanted to share some more images of these multifamily units. I mean, these are, these are places you can, you can find in St. Pete very easily. Um, you know, you have, um, here, I think my, my slide is showing here. Um, there we go. So here are some photos of multifamily units that fit in with our neighborhood. They're beautiful. I mean, these are really top-notch designs that are very classy um, and they can be affordable. I mean, here's an entrance with multiple units. Um, here's another multifamily dwelling. Um, you know, these are the kinds of things you see around our city and they look just like 
the rest. I mean, they're, they're, they're everywhere and they could be everywhere in Pinellas County too. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not we have the political will to put them there. So part of the conversation that we hear from time to time really stems between rental and home ownership. Do you all have any thoughts about, is there a project that lends itself to one side or the other? How, how do you begin to advance the conversation when that seems to be a bit of a divide for some people when they get you know, focused too much on one side of that coin or the other? No, I, I don't have a great answer for it. Um, although I'm sure that you know, Sean or Jillian maybe has some better thoughts, but I guess that what I would say is that um, at least in my own personal experience, I mean, um, you know, I'm a young father, young husband, and I mean, I rent. And I, I you know, I think that that at one point um, was, you know, the, the dream, like let's all own a home and let's have this. But I think at some level, uh, and obviously, you know, COVID has changed expectations and thought processes of everybody. But I, I think what I like about the, the rental structure is that ultimately, um, you know, it, do, it doesn't tie you down to uh, this one home and it, it allows you basically to have more, you know, disposable income and make, you know, other choices. I think the, the main issue that we see with the home ownership for us is, you know, there aren't tons of funds and buckets and magic boxes that, you know, I'm aware of that we can access make that happen. But I, I also don't, I think part of the reason it's not as much in the conversation is because, um, you know, potentially, a, you know, the, the, the younger generations and people coming up are not as fixed on owning homes. Uh, and that's just my perspective from, uh, you know, the, the age I am and the experiences I have, but that doesn't mean, uh, you know, it's just one person's quick thought on it. So. You know, 42% of the households in St. Pete are renters. That's a little higher than the national average, but that gives you an idea of how many people are not interested or not able to achieve home ownership. Now, I think that would change with significant upzoning and other policies, um, but many people don't want to buy. You know, I, there's, a, there's a real issue, like Jake said, there's an issue with people wanting things, you know, thinking, you know, the code's being written around things that people might have wanted 20 years ago, but don't want anymore um, or can't achieve anymore. And so renting has to be an option. And with well-maintained rental units, you know, you have to have architectural design guidelines and city codes that allow those types of developments to be uh, maintained just as, as much as, you know, as, as much as properties that are owned by the residents. It, it, it comes down to enforcement. And so I am a strong believer in city codes and code enforcement. Um, but it can be accomplished. Renting is uh, not an evil. Um, home ownership is better for sure. Um, but renting has to be considered, you know, just as viable an option for people who, you know, either don't want to or cannot own uh, for various reasons. I guess, Blake, you know, you, you hit upon a, a big dichotomy in the world of, of workforce housing or affordable housing or whatever we want to call it, which is you have this big trunk of rental and then you have the big trunk of home ownership and so two of the two, Jake and I are both only rental developers that's all we do um, but there's there is definitely a big role for home ownership and I mean you know my suggestion is that that governments uh, should should continue and should strengthen their down payment assistance programs that uh, where they're providing direct assistance to a family and usually there's an intermediary, either a nonprofit organization or a real estate agent that is tied into how those down payment assistance programs work. And, and, and that, that helps the resident get into a home by buying it, probably ideally in a mature neighborhood that also needs reinvigoration so that you're really creating some, some multiple community benefits um, so, you know, but as far as putting money or resources into building new affordable home ownership, I think that's a much bigger challenge for a lot of different reasons. And, and there's really only a few organizations that do it and do it well. And one of which is, of course, is Habitat for Humanity. Uh, but the down payment assistance programs have to continue to be a strong component of what local governments do. 
Uh, you all touched on the idea that, uh, and Sean, I'll go back and use some of your words, the, the kind of the fuel being money and, and land. And we've talked a little bit about the money side and the different financing mechanisms. One of the biggest challenges that we have here in Pinellas County is just the, the lack of availability of, of land and large tracts of land. Uh, many people describe us as being, as a, uh, being a built out community. So when you think about land, and we've also introduced uh, Jillian and Maddie to comment about upzoning and thinking about ways to accommodate uh, you know, more uh, on the land that we might have available. How do local governments um, utilize that tool of upzoning and not put affordable housing developers at a disadvantage with market rate developers, you know, where there's somebody else that can come in and pay top dollar for that land. How, how do we make sure that we can accommodate um, affordable housing developers in that context? I think it's totally uh, a moot point, unfortunately. I, I think the problem is so big that, and the, and the pace of change is so slow unfortunately, that being concerned about the conflict between upzoning and affordable developers is just putting the cart way before the horse. I guess theoretically down the road in 50 years, we could have this problem. But right now the main problem is the subsidies for affordable developments, you know, the construction out of the ground and the policy changes that take a lot of political will. Let's, let's think about those problems first and then we can worry about the, the very good problem of having conflicts between affordable developers and, and land use policies. Mm -hmm. Any other I, thoughts or comments from Jake or Sean? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, to, to quickly touch on it, and, and obviously we're in different realms, uh, Sean and myself and Jillian, but I would say what definitely has been uh, at least very helpful for us is, you know, we look, Sean and I, frankly, you know, we're competitors and we're competitors with another, you know, 10 to 20 other folks in our realm. And that makes it even more complicated when we have, you know, a hundred other competitors who are thinking about doing their own market rate community. So, you know, when you find sites that, uh, you know, have, you know, more of an open zoning, but it's, uh, you know, affordability is well-defined. I think there was a comment in uh, the chat about, you know, 120% AMI, percent AMI, and all these different AMIs. Um, you know, a lot of times if you actually are to charge 120% AMI, it might be higher than the market rentals in that community. So I think if you create um, what really affordable housing is, you know, for us, it's 60% AMI area median income. Sometimes it can be up to 70 or 80. And then basically, you know, you say, look, this is not something that, uh, you know, another question I'd answer in the chat is really about as of right. You know, someone said, is it important to have a site shovel ready? Mm, not really. It's more important to know that I can get to the finish line. So if your zoning code says, hey, you can get 20 units to the acre. Guess what? If you are 60% uh, and below, you know, X amount of units or you're this, you can get 40 units to the acre. And that's just something you can take to the bank. Or if you do some, you know, NGBS or different green building or anything that, you know, are some of the things that are in our vernacular and our vocabulary. And it's something we can take. We know it's just as of right. We can take that to the bank with our seller and say, look, you know, everybody else is offering you this because they can only do 40 units. I can do 80, but, but listen, like I, uh, I need some certainty as well that we can make it to the finish line. And part of those hurdles are not going to be you know, so long that, um, you know, it's going to take us a year to get to that point of actually accessing that. So I think if, you know, some thoughts are put behind, Hey, where do we want to incentivize affordable housing? What are the areas that, you know, again, when we build this, we're keeping it that way for 50, you know, five, zero years. So what are the places that we really want to cement? where this is gonna happen and how do we write the code or you know, in such a way that really this is something that affordable, and again, you know, let's come up with that definition is, can access this as a, uh, as a right aspect that we can take to the bank with the architects and everybody else we're working with to push this forward. And also the seller can and say, look, you know, I can pay you a little bit more because of this, um, but you know, it's not that anybody can access that and just do it because you know, they're, they're looking for their margins and whatever else in terms of, you know, that economy scale talk with that. So, um, Jillian? I, I think we really need to draw a distinction between the relatively large types of developments that people like Jake and Sean are doing and that major affordable developers are doing versus the kinds of two, three, four, eight unit developments that kind of the bread and butter or 
I'm going to call them more single operator types of developers are doing. There is a pretty big difference between the types of developments from the big guys and the types of developments from the small guys. And in my view, you need everyone. You need everyone doing all kinds of sizes to reach the goal. But you have to have policies that are crafted for people like Jake and Sean, as well as policies that are crafted for people who are much smaller. Um, you know, the upzoning pieces that we are arguing for in the city of St. Petersburg apply primarily to neighborhood parcels. These are single family parcels that we want to be upzoned to two or three units. Now, Jake and Sean are fighting for units that are 60 units large or 80 units large on much larger tracts of land outside of neighborhoods. Neighborhoods aren't gonna have land that's big enough for those types of units. So, um, you know, we need to attack this from two different sides. And I think as the county is thinking about implementing different policies, you might even consider having two different kinds of working groups or two different types of policy agendas to accommodate just the sheer scale of um, you know the different developments that are possible. That's very insightful. Thank you. Um, we had an audience question that came up that talked to, and, and Jake, you just touched on it in your in your previous comment about green building requirements or energy efficiencies or things like that, like solar. Do do aspects of that type of uh, regulation or, or code requirement um, get passed through to the tenants or is it, does it make it more challenging to, to finance the projects and build the project when you have those other type of requirements that are put on top of it? What we do, we have some, some nominal energy efficiency requirements that do benefit the resident by having very high efficiency um, appliances, uh, have very high efficiency windows, high efficiency air conditioning. Um, so, and, and usually what we do actually is um, when we're towards the end of construction, we usually have um, a special energy engineer do an analysis and they provide an estimate of the bill for the residents. And it's, it's usually lower than, uh, than, than the average. So um, I think that we are um, achieving some savings for folks on their light bill in their unit. Um, we've done solar panels at some of our communities. And, um, and I, I'm gonna admit, I don't know the, the, all the details of why um, the, those, un, those solar panels are not connected up to the, the person's panel in their house. Um, but we use the solar panels to, uh, to, to provide juice to the daytime operations of the building. So the hallway lighting or the pool pump, um, some of the common uh, areas, but uh, the solar panels are, don't go right into the units. And I apologize, I do not know that. I'm sure it has something to do with a combination of regulatory and engineering. Okay. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, the idea of um, trying to deal with kind of scale of projects. Um, Sean, you know, in our kind of uh, lead up to this session, we talked a little bit about, you know, kind of densities. Can you give us a sense of, you know, what kind of scale of densities you're looking for to make your projects viable, financially viable? Well, we're usually looking for anywhere from 20 to 40 units per acre um, on, a, on an urban site. And we like to be in the urban areas because we want people to live close to schools and jobs and other services. So, um, you know, a, a, a 20 unit density in, in today's day and age, that translates into a three or four story building. Um, also that 30 units per acre is in the same scale. Um, and, and we think that that um, in the urban environments, especially along corridors, that that th there should there should be just a massive upzoning to allow for these uh, three, four, five, six-story buildings. We're not talking about skyscrapers, um, but you know, three, four, five stories. Um, you know, with uh, with with a reduced parking. Um, you know, now you're getting into um, now you're opening up the opportunities drastically, especially in Pinellas County, 
because you, you can't find five or 10 acres, um, but you can find two acres. And if you can find two acres and it's 30 or 40 units per acre, then we can work with that in the, in the tax credit uh, financing structure that, that Jake and I work under. And one thing I have to step away from that, because I, I don't want to, um, you know, sweep it under the rug. And I see some of the chats about it as well, about the size of our communities and what we provide. I think it's uh, Joanne asked this question and Jillian had an answer. I mean, I, I totally agree as well. I mean, I, you know, I'm saying what I'm saying about rent thing versus home ownership. But, you know, if I brought my wife in here, she'd say, why didn't we buy a home, you know, three years ago? So I totally get it. And one of the things that I'll say that I, you know, that I really look at is I'm not the smartest guy. And what I like about working in Florida is that there are a lot of smart guys out there that have paved the way like Sean and other people in this industry that at the Florida housing level, you can, you know, order these credit underwriting reports. And basically they are a, you know, 50 plus page document that outlines the whole transaction. So I don't need to be the smartest guy I can say, okay, this is how Sean got that done over in Pinellas. I'm going to take that same strategy and get it done in Broward, or this is how this person got this 30 unit. And I, and I can study those things. I can implement them, you know, in, you know, we work out of Miami, but I work across the entire state. You know, I just finished a job in Palm Coast that was for, you know, workforce community that I looked at how somebody else did. And I said, great, I'm going to implement these things and make it happen there. So without sweeping that question under the rug, I think, you know, sheepishly, what I'll say is that I just like Sean kind of, you know, alluded to, outside of the Habitat for Humanities and other groups that are really making that happen and making that a priority. I just need someone to pave the way. And I promise I will read as much as I possibly can and then I will figure out how to do it and hopefully improve upon it. I'm just looking for that first step so that I don't become the guy grinding my teeth on it and not doing something good. Because I've, I've really figured out this niche by looking at other folks. And the next thing I'd love to do is you know, get into some historic rehabs and say, hey, what are these underutilized properties and how are people making those work and turning, you know, this mill or this church or this school that hasn't been used for however long and making affordable housing? I, I don't know yet. I don't have a good answer on that one. That's my next step. And hopefully, you know, can get out of that home ownership piece as well, because I agree, super important. And I just need somebody to pave the way. And, you know, maybe with a few years time, I'll, I'll figure it out as well. Well, I, I know we could all continue this conversation for, for much, much longer, but unfortunately we're running out of time. So I, I wanted to take a minute uh, you know, to our speakers, Sean, Jake, Jillian, thank you both and all so much uh, you know, for joining us and for giving your insights and your experience on this whole thing and, and taking the time out of your day to join us. For our audience members, if you are not able to join us for the entirety of this session, or if you missed session one, you can view this entire series on the county's YouTube channel. As a reminder, session three is in two weeks. We'll talk about some of the creative approaches already happening in local government. So please remember to register at homesforpinellas.org. We look forward to having you join us and thank you all for attending.